So my name is Andy Willis and I am a professional organizer. Um, really it's not as scary as it sounds. Um, I don't make people get rid of 50% of their possessions and I don't beat people if things fall out of their closets. I'm actually a very, very nice, non-judgmental person. Uh, what I do do is I help people, I like to say that I help people who have cluttered closets, disorganized desks, and chaotic calendars to simplify their homes, their offices, and their lives and regain their sanity. So that's what I try to help people with when I work with them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I do live in Perry. I work around middle Georgia and I've seen a little bit of everything. Um, I'll just go ahead and tell you I have actually been on hoarders. I was not one of them, I was not the main person that you see, but you do see me in the episode. I was one of the worker bees. Um, it's not something I do often, but it was a really, really interesting experience. I actually got invited to go to another one about two weeks ago and um, went and got turned away because it was such squalid conditions that unless I wanted to get a shovel and help shovel, they didn't have a job for me. So they still paid me, so it's all good. So, okay, today. Um, my presentation is called Organizing by the Numbers, and I want to show you a series of cartoons to begin with. I want you to see if you see yourself in any of these. So those of you, if you can't see, the mother is vacuuming, um, what is it, Billy's room, and he says, now I won't know if my things are missing or just put away. And if you have teenagers or young children, you know that it can be right here and they can't find it. And husbands too sometimes. <laughs> Um, do you have a walk-in closet? No, we couldn't afford it. I've just got to jam it in and slam the door as quickly as you can closet. That's a really popular model, by the way. In your home office or your work office, you call it chaos, I call it florganized. I just was with a client the other day whose whole office was florganized, shelf-organized, everywhere. And then finally, Barry's a very fine example of our clear desk policy. <laughs> Anybody see themselves in any of these? Maybe somebody they know, somebody they love. Um, I will tell you that when I meet people and tell them what I do, um, they either go, oh, I need you to come to my house, or I don't need you, but my sister-in-law really needs your help. So the, the, the reasoning behind showing you those hold on just one second, is that we can all relate to all of these things. So many of my clients think they're the only run ones who are struggling with having too much stuff, having overflowing filing cabinets, whoops, or having um, just not enough time to get everything done in the day. When I go to people's houses, they feel very anxious. Um, they're overwhelmed. Um, I was with a, a, a client yesterday, a mother of four, peop four children, um, all under the age of nine, and she just is overwhelmed with all the stuff in her house because she has four kids. So she's trying to deal with her kids, but then she says, the stuff is what I have to deal with on the weekends and I don't want to anymore. And the truth of it is, is my slides are not cooperating. Um, you are not alone if you feel this or you know someone who feels this. This is something that everyone struggles with. Um, one of the things people say to me frequently when I walk in their door is, please tell me I'm not the worst you've ever seen. Is this the worst you've ever seen? Am I a hoarder? Tell me the truth. In all honesty, they'll have a, a little pile of paper on their kitchen counters. And that does not make you a hoarder. That's a whole different story. It's a whole different talk. Um, even professional organizers struggle with their organizational issues. Uh, if you were to look at my office right now, you would go, why in the world is she up there talking to us about organization? But the truth is, I've been with clients all week, and I've been busy, and I've been running, and I haven't had time to collect. That's tomorrow. So, 43% of people in this particular study describe themselves as disorganized. I honestly feel that's probably a pretty low number. I don't know who they were exactly talking to. But when it comes to being disorganized, it's different things. It's stuff. Maybe you have too much stuff. You can't find what you need when you need it. Uh, maybe it's information. There's so much digital overload and so much paper overload that we face these days. You know, we thought we'd get away from paper when computers came in, but no. Even though I do have my notes on my iPad, um, you know, I still have paper all over my house. 
Uh, disorganized could be time management, getting out the door on time, having enough time in your day to get everything done that you need to do. Um, oops, why is this skipping? Um, and I will tell you that all of these photos that I'm showing you in this presentation are from clients' homes, and I do have permission to use them. Um, so just to show you a little insight into what people's homes look like, because when you see them on the outside, they might look really put together. Um, but then when you walk in the door, they do have clutter. Um, the house I was in yesterday, little messy. They have four kids. Every single cupboard, closet, drawer was packed full of stuff because they shoved it. So it looked nice. So don't trust what you see on the surface. Um, <clears throat> I will tell you also that um, the, the idea of being organized means different things to different people. Some people want their home to look like a magazine, look like a show off HGTV. Um, I will tell you from experience, those things are staged. Nobody lives in those houses the way they are. Um, I was actually fortunate to participate about four years ago in an Extreme Home Makeover show. It was up in uh, Madison. And there was a group of about 15 organizers. We went in to see what we could do. They gave us the kitchen to organize. So 15, 15 of us in one little kitchen, that was really fun. But we um, organized it like we would a, a client's home. Well, they came back and made us change everything because it didn't look good on TV. And there's you know, a whole um, garage full of extra stuff that they bought that they just leave for the homeowner. So now they've given the homeowner all this clutter that they don't necessarily use. So. So some people want to have that sort of perfected vision. Other people just want to be able to find their keys in the morning. My personal definition of being organized is being able to find what I need when I need it easily. It drives me crazy the 1% of the time that I can't find something that I know I have. Um, because even though sometimes my house might get a little untidy, I know where most everything is. So that's my personal definition. So you have to kind of decide what your definition, what's good for you. Does anybody want to guess what we spend 55 minutes a day doing? We spend 55 minutes a day looking for things that we know we own but just can't find. So do the math at six hours a week, 28 hours a month, 341 hours a year. I don't know about you, but I have better things to do with my time than do that. Um, there's a um, little uh, picture going around on, uh, I've seen it on Pinterest and I've probably seen it on Facebook, um, that says organized people are just lazy because we don't want to take the effort to have to look for things. So these are things that we know we have but we can't find. This is a really interesting little um, survey from Ikea of the top five things people can't find or look for. I think it's pretty true, except for I'm not sure how many men have been searching for their wedding albums on a regular basis. It probably means that they don't know where it is. But on a daily basis, looking for socks, the remote control, your car keys, your wallet with your driver's license. Um, for women, you know, we've got to find that pair of shoes in the pile in the bottom of the closet. The child can't find the toy that's right there in front of them. Your wallet, your lipstick, and the remote control because you have, because probably your husband has found it and hid it from you. <laughs> So the uh, solution to that is giving everything a home. If things don't have a home, you can't put them away. If you can't put them away, they end up sitting on the counter. This is a, a drawer in the uh, library of um, my son's former elementary school. And I go in there, and I used to volunteer. Now I sub there occasionally for the librarian. And obviously, the picture on the left <laughs> <laughs> excuse me, is the before picture. Drove me crazy to come in and see it like that. Couldn't find a rubber band, couldn't find the pen I needed to use. So I asked her, I said, Jennifer, can I come in next time and can I bring some things with me and can I organize the drawers? And of course she said yes. So this is what the drawer looked like after. Everything has a home. There's a bin for the markers, a bin for the rubber bands, for the staples, for the staplers. Uh, so. It doesn't look exactly like this. This was about three or four years ago, but it is still pretty close. And there are a lot of people who use that desk. So I think that says a lot to having homes for things and being able to find them again. Um, 
one of our sort of rock stars in the organizing industry, her name is Barbara Hemphill, and she said clutter is just delayed decisions. So when you take those socks off and leave them on the floor, you haven't decided that you're going to pick them up and put them in the hamper. Um, if you lay the scissors down on the counter because they don't have a home, then they become part of the clutter of your everyday life. It's just a delayed decision because you haven't decided where they're going to live. This is another example. Um, several of the examples I'll show you are actually from my own home. This is one of the drawers in my kitchen. The one on the left is the before. It's not terrible. I know a lot of clients who'd love their drawers to look like that. But I needed something a little different. Um, at this time, my kids were probably uh, 8 and 11 trying to give them more responsibility, putting dishes away, things like that. And I need things put back in the same place on a regular basis so, so I can find things. So we made this drawer into the what's on the right. And this is a, um, a special drawer liner. It's, um, I can't remember what it's called, but it's a uh, latex sheet that goes on the bottom. So it's sticky and it has little, um, you can see like these little divots that are movable. So you can create whatever you want to create. Um, and these are probably like the top 12 things I use in my kitchen. Probably, I'm in this drawer on a daily basis, um, if not several times a day. And what you don't see is underneath each one of those items is a label. So underneath the, um, not all my drawers are labeled, so don't worry about that. But the um, underneath, say, the can opener, it says can opener. The reasoning behind that was not that I didn't know where the can opener went, because I did the drawer, but so my kids knew where it went. And when my mom comes and visits, she knows where it goes. So when it comes time to open that can for dinner tomorrow night, we know where it is, or we know it's missing. The whole thing started when somebody lost my pizza cutter, and I, you know, we think it got thrown out in a pizza box, but that was years ago, and it still drives me crazy. So that's... Um, you know, giving homes to things really makes a very big difference. Has anybody heard of the Pareto Principle? Anybody know what that is? Or the 80-20 rule? Okay. This is, uh, the Pareto Principle is actually something that was created and it, it covers most of your life, but as far as um, organizing is concerned, it means we use 20% of whatever 80% of the time. So think about it. You wear 20, probably wear 20% of your wardrobe 80% of the time. I know my kids could live out of a laundry basket. I could wash their clothes, hand it back to them. They dress out of it for the week, wash the clothes, put it back in the laundry basket. Um, they wear the same clothes all the time. And it really can be with anything in your life. It can be clothes, it can be paper. If you look in your filing cabinet, um, particularly our home filing cabinet, probably 80% of the papers in your filing cabinet you will never ever look at again, and most of them you probably don't need. Um, same, same with work, unless you have special requirements for how long you keep things. <clears throat> um, and just general stuff. You know, we always, we gravitate to the things we like, the things that are really comfortable to us. Um, so, for example, this is a closet. Um, that I went through with a client, and the left is the before, the right is the after. We got rid of so many pairs of clothes because we went through and we asked questions. What does it fit for clothing? Um, our bodies change as we, as we age. Maybe we've lost weight, maybe we've gained weight. Um, is it flattering? You know, is it a pair of jeans from 10 years ago that have mom, mom waist and they just don't look good anymore? Um, is it ripped and can't be can't be fixed, is it stained? Um, if you don't love it anymore, you know, a lot of times I'll find things in the closets that have tags on them and people bought it because it was a good deal, but then they got it home and went, eh, and it just lives in the closet and takes up space. So, you know, getting rid of part of that 80% that doesn't suit your lifestyle is really, really helpful. Um, just a quick tip for your closet if you want to try to think, because we think we wear more of our clothes more often than we actually do. Um, so pretend my arm is the, hang is the rod and your hangers are going to go on the rod like this. Take right now the rest of your summer warm weather clothes. Turn them, the hanger around so it's facing you. Then as you wear that shirt, the pants, whatever, turn the hanger the right way. 
at the end of the season, you will see everything you haven't worn. And you'll go, oh, really? I thought I wore that, that dress this season. Well, no, you didn't. Um, so it's just something to keep, especially maybe, you know, since we're hopefully getting to the end of summer, when you pull out your fall winter stuff, do that. And it, it just gives you a really idea of, of what you actually use. Uh, this is another one, um, an example of paper that people keep. Um, this was a closet of a woman. Her husband had passed away a few years ago, and he was in public service. Um, I, he was an elected official of some sort. And most of the paper on the middle three shelves was letterhead. It was envelopes, stationery, um, all sorts of things that had to do with his elected office and she just had not cleaned them out. So we gave some of the, um, the envelopes and the letterhead to their children as sort of mementos and then the rest we recycled. And look at how much room we opened up. We got rid of things that she didn't need, things that needed to go back to his office. Um, and we just made so much more room so now she can actually use this and this is you know, her 20% of the things that she really uses. Um, one of the things that really catches people up is they go, oh, but I need to keep it just in case. It might be useful one day, and that's a really, really big thing. Um, maybe not so much for clothes, but for stuff and for, for paper. Um, one of the things that I just suggest that you ask yourself is what's the worst thing that can happen if I don't have this? You know, if it's a piece of paper, um, if it's a report, what's the worst thing if I recycle this report right now? Can I get it online? I can get it online when I need to. So it's not the end of the world. Um, there's a, a couple of guys there um, named are Josh Beck and Josh Beck and uh, Nick, uh, Ryan Nicodemus, and they call themselves the minimalists. And they advocate a simplified, minimalized lifestyle, probably a lot more simple than a lot of us could really, really handle. But they have some really good ideas. I saw them speak at a conference earlier this year and one of the things that they recommend, um, well, they, first of all, they say that the words just in case are the three most dangerous wor words in the world because we keep so much just in case. You know, it, it's still kind of that um, mentality from the depression that has carried on that we need to hold on to things because we might need it. But they use something that they call the 2020 principle. And so if you're, you're, you're just trying to decide whether you want to keep something, you're really on the fence, think about. Their, their, their rule for themselves is, can I get this for $20 or less within 20 miles of my house? And if the answer is yes, you could probably get rid of it because it's not going to break the bank to buy it again if you need it. Um, that doesn't work as much for larger items, but it's, you kind of keep the same idea in your head. Okay, so when we declutter, we have 40% less, and I love this one, housework. I don't, I don't know, there might be, is there anybody in the room that loves to clean the house? Okay, Rachel's our, our, one, our one oddball. Um, I don't like to clean my house. I have a cleaning lady. I'll organize my house till the cows come home, but I don't want to scrub my bathroom floor. But when you have less stuff in your house, there's less to clean. There's less to clean around. This is a sort of... Um, extreme example. This was a uh, kind of like a mother-in-law suite in the basement of a house. This was the guest room um, and obviously they had stored bins of toys in here and the children had got in and just poof, was like a big tornado. And then the cats got in there and left us little presents everywhere. So they were trying to clean this <coughs> room out so <coughs> they could actually have people stay there. So uh, the homeowner and I, we worked a couple hours. That's all it took. Got, you know, threw away the stuff that the cats had sort of messed up and pulled out the toys that the kids wanted to keep. Most of it was not stuff the kids wanted to keep. So we boxed that up, bagged it up, and that's what the room looked like afterwards. So even though this was really kind of a clean sweep situation, just think about how could you, how could you make that bed? It would be so hard to make that bed, you'd have to move things and wrangle things around. But then when you go and try to make that bed, it's so much easier. And then this is all the stuff we got rid of down the hallway. Um, I think things on the side were going to other places in the house and then everything else went in my car. I have to have a big car because I haul a lot of stuff for my clients. 
This is another example from my own home. This is my um, side-by-side fridge freezer, which I absolutely hate, but it's what we have. And on the left, how do you cook dinner out of that? How do you find the frozen green beans in that? You, either you don't, or you buy more, and then you end up with five bags of green beans in your freezer, um, or you have to pull everything out, food goes bad. So, in this case, I pulled everything out, reorganized it, everything has a place, there's baskets, these are nice little stacking baskets I think I got at Walmart. They're labeled, so people, again, other people in my house know where things go, where to get them, and it makes it so much easier. My kids now can go in, and they're a little older now, they can go in and pull out a bag of tater tots and make themselves a snack if they want to. Um, that saves me time every single day. <laughs> This one is um, about our biggest investments, our cars. This survey found by the U.S. Department of Energy found out that 25% of Americans with two car garages cannot park a car in their garage, which is really kind of scary when you think the average price of a car today is probably about $40,000, if not up to $80,000, depending on what you drive. Um, but even a, a cheap car is $20,000. Um, and instead, people are keeping boxes of junk, empty boxes, stuff like that, in their garages while their expensive investment is sitting in the Georgia sun with the dashboard cracking and, you know, the paint starting to peel. Now, 32% of that 25% only can park one car in their two-car garage. And I will admit, I'm in that 32%. Um, but that's because my car's big and my husband's car's little, so he can stay outside. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> this is a garage that I did uh, a few years ago. Um, it was a very large garage. It was a three-car garage. One opening was probably really a two-and-a-half car opening because they both drove huge SUVs and then they had this one single bay on the side. It was all open inside though. And this one bay, they had very neatly shoved everything over into this one bay. And if you can look closely, the picture on the right's a little dark, but they had shelves. In fact, in the top right corner, there's a shelf stacked up on top of a shelf. They were storing their shelves. But they couldn't get to anything they wanted. The kids couldn't get their bikes out. Um, the family was a big um, Georgia family. They loved to go to games and tailgate. They couldn't get all their tailgate stuff. Um, when we went through everything, we found multiples because they couldn't find what they needed when it was time to pack the car up to go to the game. So we pulled everything out, used their shelves, didn't have to buy a single shelf. It was great. And we organized it kind of like a department store. We put all of their... Um, uh, tailgating stuff together, all their household paints together, all the kids' toys went in one place, all the pet stuff went in the other. And this is a really good example of a garage that has no storage in it when you move in. If you buy a brand new house, usually you walk in and there's the walls, there's the door, the garage door, and there's a door that goes into your house. It's just a box, there's nothing there. And if that's the case, you're gonna just pile stuff on the floor because there's no, nothing else to do with it. Um, but having shelves gets the stuff off, off the floor, which helps you if it rains and things get wet. Um, it also will help keep some of the critters out of it. We have lots of little critters around here. Um, this is another garage that I did. <coughs> um, had a lot of smalls in it, a lot of um, tools and things like that. So it already had a workbench in it. We added a pegboard across the back. So again, all of the um, primary tools that the husband used were had a home, so he could find them. But this ba these bottom two pictures, the left is the before, the right is the after, they had all these things piled in the back corner. And this was a large two-car garage that they did not park cars in. They parked all their ATVs in um, and bikes and all that kind of stuff. But they had this pile in the back corner, which it doesn't look terrible, but when we started pulling things out, there was so much moisture back there. We had to throw a lot of things away because they had gotten moldy and mildewed. What we did was we put in a um, set of really heavy-duty shelves that were open so airflow can get through and they're not going to get that moisture damage. And again, we put all the coolers together, all of the lawn chairs together. We grouped things together so things had a home. So, you know, 
it is very possible to organize your garage and still be able to park your car inside. And this is the big one. 80% of household clutter is the result, or I'm sorry, it, it's, it's due to disorganization, not that you don't have enough space. Unless you have added more people to your household, you know, if I, I have a lot of clients that will call me and go, my daughter and her three children just moved into our two bedroom home. Come help me. Think, well, that's hard because you've just increased the volume of people and stuff in your house. But if that hasn't happened and you just have too much stuff, it's time to kind of go through that purge and get rid of things so you can use the space that you have. This last example is, um, it was actually my very first paying job when I started my business six years ago. And I was really in over my head. I didn't realize it till afterwards. Um, but, uh, but, but we made it work. I was hired by one of the teachers <coughs> at my son's school to come to her mother-in-law's house. And she gifted me to her mother-in-law. But her mother-in-law was not involved. She said, you go do what you all need to do. I'll come home later. So um, Tracy and I did this in a day. I think it was about a 10-hour day that we did this. Um, as clutter developed in the house, they would take it out to this building. The husband had built this building. It was probably 25 feet deep by maybe 50 feet long. It was a workshop on one end. But the majority, all of the building that you see here is a big, big room, big storage room. He had built specifically for her wife, his wife and her stuff. She had a little bit of a shopping problem. Um, so this is what it looked like when I got there. You see the door. This is what it looked like when we walked inside. There was a path that went around this pile, but I, literally the pile came up to my eyes. I could stand on the back side and barely see Tracy on the other side. Um, and it was a mix of stuff. It was brand new things that had been purchased for wedding gifts or baby gifts and um, never been given. It was old, old toys that the grandkids had outgrown. It was trash, just boxes, bags, things like that. So we worked throughout the day, and this is that what happened after. We had two trucks full of trash, oh, it's trash is on the right, and two trucks full of Goodwill things, things that were still usable, but that they didn't need to keep. And afterwards, this was the after. That's the before, this is the after. There was a floor. We found rugs. Um, we, the shelving was already there. The husband had built the shelving. Um, we took all of those great new gift items. Like she would go to Kohl's and find a really pretty set of dishes um, that she wanted to give a newlywed and then lose it in the pile. So this was actually her little department store. These are your wedding gifts. These are your bridal shower gifts. These are your kids' gifts, your men's gifts. And then over on the right were um, a lot of um, kitchenware, small appliances and things like that that you, you know, use once in a blue moon. Um, and I, as far as I know, she was pretty happy with it. Um, you know, we didn't, we had very strong guidelines, but this is the view back towards the door. So now you can see you can get in and out of the building. And the husband was so excited because he had a workbench in the back of this room that he couldn't get to, and now he could get to his workbench. So the moral of all of this, that the reason I tell you all these statistics is that the numbers don't lie. If you feel overwhelmed or anxious because of clutter, whether it be at your desk at the office or if it's in your closet at home, know you're not alone. There's a lot of other people that are right out there with you, and there's a lot of things that you can do to make things better. Um, I'm going to take questions in just a second, but one of the things that I love to do is I love to share information with people. I'm very active on the web. I have um, a blog on my website, which is goodlifeorganizing.net. Um, I also am very, very active on Facebook and Twitter, um, Pinterest. I'm on lots of different things, um, but those are probably the main ones. Uh, right now on my blog and on my Facebook page, I'm doing a series called the ABCs of Organizing. And um, today is M. M is for maintenance, magazines, makeup, and medicine. And so every couple of days, I'm giving some suggestions on um, how to deal with those things. They're all things that we all have to do. Um, so I welcome you to, you know, to reach out to me after today, um, uh, like my Facebook page. In um, September, 
I'll do what I call the fall fling, and it's, um, how many days, are they 30 days in September? It'll be 30 days of things you can get rid of. So on day one, I'll say, go and get rid of all your single socks, or go, go, go through your, um, your magazine stash. So every day is just a little bit something that you can do, and they're little bite-sized um, nuggets of information. So with that being said, does anybody have any questions or anything they'd like to ask me? Or to answer them all? <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, I'm trying to remember what it's called. Mm. I can't remember. Yeah, it's it's a it was a kit. Um, Oh, it's right on the tip of my tongue. Hopefully I'll think of it before we're done and I can tell you. Um, the nice thing about that is it's, um, you know, it's sticky. So it's, I mean, not sticky like super sticky, but just has a little bit of a stick to it so it doesn't slide around in your drawer. And then the items kind of stay right there. And the fact that you can um, move it around. Drawer decor, that's what it's called. Drawer, D-E-C-O-R, drawer decor and they come in different colors. Um, they recommend them for people who work maybe with um, kids with motor, sensory motor issues, that it's something that you know, they can have in their drawers um, to help them grasp things better. They have a lot of, lot of uses. It's a neat product. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I have a question. Okay. Tupperware is like my nemesis. What do you suggest for that in like pants, like tops? Okay. Um, for Tupperware, the very first thing I suggest you do is pull every single piece out of your cupboard, your drawer, whatever. Match lids with bottoms. Um, if you never have a use for a bottom without a lid, all the single things need to be recycled. If you can afford it, I would, you know, if, if, if most of what you have is like butter dishes and, you know, the things that lunch meat come in, I really like investing in a set that matches and stacks really, really well. Rubbermaid has a set that you can get, I want to say it's like 40 pieces, and it's, it's not, but $25, $30. Um, you really want something that can stack and compress. Um, because when you have things that are all odd shapes and sizes, that's when you kind of get that big jumble of things coming out. Um, and, you know, it's like anything in life when you put a little bit of money into the quality, it's going to last you longer, and it's going to it's going to store better as well. Um, lids and pots and pans. One of the things that I um, really like, uh, if you have room in your cupboard, I don't know exactly what the names the name of it is, but it you can't there. Um, it's a, a pan holder, and it it looks like you know on a on an office desk. Sometimes you have those wire dividers that you can put folders in, but they're flat, not the raised ones. They're flat. They make things like that that are bigger, that are for kitchens. Um, you can leave it so the openings are up like this. You could put sheet pans in it. You could put your lids in it. Um, in my, in my um, pan cabinet, I flipped mine on the side, and I have all of my skillets. I've kind of like filed them. And, and it, it works really well because then you're using the vertical space instead of stacking things on top of each other. Because if you have, if, you're, if you're, like your pans are, um, have the nonstick coating on them, they scratch when you put things in it. So having some sort of a divider. I did see the other day um, in a store where they're now making these little, I mean, they're almost like a sheet of paper, but they're made out of felt, and you're supposed to put them in between your pans. I don't know who's going to do that on a daily basis. It's a nice thought, but um, I like getting things apart so when you need the thing that's in the middle, you don't have to disassemble everything. Yes? Okay. Mm -hmm. In my attic, and I was recently trying to figure out what to do with it because now I'm stuck with six years worth of paper. And right. I don't know where to take it or what to do with it. It's good of it, but it's got personal information. Right. So, if you have a lot of paper that you're going to get rid of, um, the easiest thing to do is to 
throw it in a box or a bag and haul it down to Staples or Office Depot. They have a shredding, a secure shredding. You take it in, you watch them dump it in the thing. And I think it's they're the heavy duty ones so you don't have to take out the, the staples and all that kind of stuff. And it shreds it and it usually will shred it into little teeny tiny pieces and it's in a lock box and it'll stay locked until the shredding company comes and picks it up and takes it away. Um, every once in a while, um, I know in Houston County, uh, Robbins Federal Union, Fe Robbins Federal Credit Union will do um, a shred day. Usually they do one in either Warner Robbins Perry area and then one. Yeah, they do it about twice a year and they usually have a limit of, you know, like one or two boxes. Um, but usually, you know, you can, if you have three, they'll be okay with that. They just don't want you to bring a whole truckload. Um, if you had an extreme amount, like, you know, you were cleaning out an office that had been there for 20, 30 years. There are companies in the area, I think one's called Shred Monster, and they will bring a truck that has a shredder to your house. Yeah, but that's, I mean, I don't think your five or six years of bills is probably, yeah, yeah. Um, there are several good guides online. Um, the one that I like is on bankrate.com that gives you suggestions on how long to keep different kinds of papers because I know that's a big um, question people have. How long do I need to keep this bank statement? How long do I need? And while it is individual to every person in your situation, um, there are some general guidelines that people can follow. Um, you know, you, you probably don't need your gas bill from 1999, you know, so, um, and I have found people, I have found pay stubs from the 50s. Um, so, yeah, people, people just, you know, you keep it and it goes in a drawer and you don't think about it. And, and that becomes your 80% of the stuff that you don't ever look at again. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. It's a good system. Yeah, usually um, when I work with clients, we'll have, um, you have one pile that's trash because it doesn't matter what kind of room you're in, you're going to have trash or recycling, you know, broken hangers, that kind of stuff. Um, you're going to have things you're going to give away, so it's your donate pile, and then your keep. And then you probably have a fourth pile that things that belong in other places. Because um, inevitably, even in a bedroom that you use as your master bedroom, you're going to find something in there that belongs in somebody else's room or really should be in the office or those sorts of things. So that's a, um, that's a really good system to use. Um, what I would suggest if you're going to use like, bags is for, use like one set for clear, one clear bag set for say the keep or, or the, the donate and then a black bag for your trash because if you use black bags for everything then oops sorry then you have to figure out which one is trash and which one is donate and um, just a word on donating if you're going to um, take say clothes or any items to a, a charity and you want to get a tax write-off you have to keep a list of what you take um, it used to be you could say uh, I took three hundred dollars worth of items to Goodwill on June 6th. Um, now you have to itemize it. And if you've ever done your own taxes, it's really, really fun to sit there and enter in the 10 pairs of boys' jeans and three pairs of boys' tennis shoes. And But it adds up. It really, really adds up. So just know that when you're putting stuff in the bag, just keep a list of what you're putting in there. And it'll it'll help you when tax time comes around. Mm -hmm. Is there a list of If you go, I think the Salvation Army has a valuation um, suggestion. Usually, the, I think what the IRS uses as their guide, and this is, I just think this, I might not be 100% right, but it's how much would it sell for. So if you took the boys' jeans to um, Goodwill and they're in good shape, they might sell them for $5. That would be your valuation. It's how much they're worth. You know, even though they might have been polo jeans and you spent fifty dollars on them, you know, they, they, <laughs> um, I don't either. I buy my son's stuff at Walmart because he grows so fast. Uh, but yeah, if you look at Salvation Army, um, if if you do your own taxes, like on TurboTax, they actually have a built-in valuation guide. And you just go in and say, I did three pairs of boys' jeans and they're in good shape, and it'll say they're worth fifteen dollars. Anybody else? 
Yes. If you have a ring that's gotten out of control, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, what's the best way to approach it? You just take everything out before you put it back in? Or how, how does that make you feel if I say take everything out of that room? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> yeah, that's usually the case. I, it, it, if you can do it in little bite-sized chunks, at least to get started, and know that you can make progress, like go in and say, I mean, if it's a room that you physically can't walk into, can you deal with the first six inches of stuff? Throw it away, decide you're going to put it somewhere else, you're going to keep it, but right now you'll store it somewhere else, so then you can go the next six inches. Um, anytime that you do an organizational project, if it feels overwhelming to you, make it into really bite-sized chunks. So maybe it's an extra bedroom and it's where all the boxes have been thrown and so maybe you can go in and one day you just gather up as many empty boxes as you can find and put them in the recycling bin. And then maybe the next day you come in and gather up um, all the shopping bags that have never been emptied and start emptying them one at a time. Because um, usually the overwhelm is going to make you turn around and close the door and never go back in there again. But if you break it into really small pieces, either say I'm going to do you know, physically this much or I'm going to spend 15 minutes, a lot of times you get to that in 15 minutes and you're still ready to go. But then you can, if you're not, you can give yourself permission, okay, I've worked on it for 15 minutes, now I can go away. And I'll come back later and do 15 more minutes. And eventually you'll eat away at it. So baby steps. That would be my suggestion. Anybody else? Well, if any of you have um, any questions or think of anything else that you would like to ask or you don't want to ask in front of the group, um, I'll be here for a little bit. You can also email me or contact me um, online. And like I said, I'm, I'm there very often. And uh, I'd love to hear from you.